Most of you may already know Ravi, but as mentioned, he's the founder and CEO at Smooth Apps and a professional Scrum trainer and course steward through Scrum.org. Um, he has over 20 years of software delivery and consulting experience and over 10 years of experience in agile enablement for companies of up to 10,000 people. And then Jay uh, Shu is an award-winning animator, cartoonist, designer, and motion graphics artist. Um, he has 20 years of experience developing compelling interactive design and video content for Fortune 500 companies. He's an adjunct professor, a national conference speaker, and an author. So we're really honored to have him with, with us here uh, on the webinar tonight. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jay and Ravi and let them introduce their topic and So all right. Ravi, really quickly, uh, I just wanna yeah. say, in addition to doing all that, that other crazy stuff, um, I'm currently working with Sabre uh, as a design strategist on the UX team. So that's uh, kind of, I give a little bit of that background because we're gonna be talking about that uh, during this webinar. So that I do have a lot of experience working with the Agile teams and coaches. Jenny, thank you for the introductions. Jay, thank you for adding that. And in fact, that's a great segue. So uh, Jay and I met at Sabre, and uh, I think it's, it was one of the best uh, blessings I, I have had and one of the best gifts that I got from Sabre is my friendship with Jay. So what we're going to do today is, uh, Jay and I, those of you who have uh, had the blessing to interact with Jay and the misfortune to interact with me, know that uh, we, we have so many stories. Uh, and what we would like to do today is Jay and I try to handpick some of uh, the most powerful stories that we have come across in our career that can help build a bridge between our professions. So Jay is, is from the UX profession in addition to so many others, and I'm from the, um, mainly from the software delivery as, uh, profession. And both of us have seen that our uh, people from our tribes sometimes end up butting heads with each other. And so we were wondering, uh, is there something we can do to help us or members of our profession understand what it feels like to be in the shoes of the other a stepping stone to build a bridge so that together we can deliver more value to our stakeholders. So that's what we are trying to do today. Uh, we've got a bunch of stories. We, uh, we have got five stories lined up for you and we will monitor the time. And if we run out of time, uh, we'll, uh, we may not get through all five, but we'll try our best to uh, make this valuable. So let me start with the story. So Jay, this one, uh, I need your feedback. So this is what, what happened to me. Uh, and I will need some, uh, I'm gonna ask the, our attendees for some feedback as well. So this is a real world story. Um, I was an agile coach for a client where the customer issues were going up, the escalations were going up. So we started listening to the customers. We started asking them what's going on. Um, our customer service agents, account managers, uh, they spoke to the customers and on the agile delivery side, we in turn spoke to the customer facing colleagues to find out what's going on, what's hurting the client. And there was a long list of, of pain points. And so we started delivering a bunch of releases, uh, delivered a whole bunch of new features. And then the good news was that over time, the uh, customer issues went down. So I have a poll for the audience, informal poll. Um, I've not experimented with Zoom polls and I'm not going to do it now. Uh, but please use the chat window to share your thoughts. Based on this story, is this good or is this bad? And I'll probably give you just 60 seconds and I will start uh, monitoring your answers. Just to recap, had a bunch of customer issues going up, listened to the customer, customer was in pain, delivered a bunch of releases, customer issues started going down. Good, bad, why? All right, I'm starting to see some answers coming. I, I'm seeing a bunch of goods. I'm seeing Danielle is saying not enough information. 
and he's saying it's good all right mike is saying it's good if the outcome solved the problems that the customer voice is having and yeah. harry is saying i think it's neutral um harry could you elaborate a little bit why it's neutral and then tommy said well it's good if the releases were based on listening to the customer right great answers let me complete the story and please continue to share your thoughts we'll be monitoring the chat panel and the q and a panel um so here's and harry's answer was look it depends if the client was satisfied or not but if it dealt with a prior mistake it could be bad all right so let's see what happens next so what happened next was uh we started we realized that the the customers one of the reasons that the customers issues started going down was that the customers had either canceled their contracts or they stopped caring and they stopped talking to us so over time what happened was customer issues went down but after a bunch of time cancellations went up and revenue went down because customers started leaving us in droves and then we and you know we lost some of our best customers the customer service representatives they had good relationships with some of the former customers and they asked them and uh, what happened uh, you know we saw that your customer issues had gone down so we thought you were happy and they told us well uh, we stopped talking to you because we felt like it was hopeless that you wouldn't listen to us and you stopped caring so so jay i am really confused uh, you know i'm a very data driven guy and uh, based on the data when the customer issues went down i thought everything was going well but obviously not so from a ux perspective can you please help me out what did i do wrong what can i learn from this and what can i do better in the future so um great question and uh you know i i always tell my students when i'm i'm teaching that the best answer to any question is always it depends because almost always it it does depend um there the uh and there's uh, two stories that come to mind first a little one um the first time uh i i had an opportunity to be a consultant as a as a user which is years ago now but i walked into a team and the um designer the ux designer who I was working with said our clients are extremely angry at us they are they are furious they are you know absolutely through the roof angry and i said okay well that's good and she goes what are you talking about how is that good how is that a good thing and i said well i've been married now for over 20 years and um what i know about marriage is that when your wife still gets angry at you for coming in late that means she still loves you and she wants to work it out when she she doesn't care that you come in late that probably means there may be a lawyer in your future And so customers are kind of that way that that if they're angry and they're engaged that means they still believe that there's an opportunity to work with you and work it out and they still care and and that's really I think kind of a little bit what happened in your story is they made the decision that they didn't care as much and so they they just said no we'll we'll find someone else and they don't always send you a dear john letter so uh um in user experience there's also two types of basic research you can get you can get quantitative which data folks love to get right you love to get quantitative uh data which is uh which tells you what and how but uh there's another data research that we get in in user experience that's qualitative data and you get that by talking to people and a lot of people don't like qualitative data because it seems a little softer you know people like good solid metrics and numbers and other things but qualitative data tells you why 
things are happening. Uh, the other story that comes to mind was I, I, I happened to be early in my career again, sitting uh, with a very skilled uh, veteran researcher, and I was just literally sitting in the research session to learn. And we started off the session, and she was asking, she was working for a tech company, and she said, what do you think of our software? And uh, the user on the other side said, oh, your software is great. And they said, okay. And then she goes, what would you change? And the person said, nothing. And so we kept going through uh, the, the, um, the session. And about, you know, a third of the way through, the, the user suddenly says, oh, this is where I get out of your software and I open up Excel. And she goes, really? And he goes, yeah, I don't, I don't trust your numbers. So we have our own, you know, spreadsheets that we kind of put in our own data and do our own calculations on the side. And then we jump back into your software when we think that we figured out numbers that make sense for us. And we're like, oh, really? Okay. And so we kept going. And then about another two thirds through, they said, oh yeah, this is where we actually open up your competitor software. And we're going, what? Oh yeah, well, they do things, you know, a lot differently than you do and maybe a little better on this side. So, you know, we just use, we just bought one of their modules and we, and we use that and we develop our stuff here. And then, you know, when we're done with that, then we finish up in your software. So if you remember at the beginning of the story, how it started off is, what do you think of this software? And they said, oh, this software is great. What would you change? Nothing. And doesn't that, isn't that reminiscent of those surveys, those customer surveys that you send out? How do you like your software? It's great. What would you change? Nothing. So the lesson here then is if you're not, I'll use the wife example, if you're not taking care of and spending time with your wife, eventually she may, you know, divorce you. So customers are the same way. They need attention. They want to know you care. They want to know that you're hearing their problems and addressing their problems with your product. And if you don't, they may find someone else. And that's exactly what, what happened. So maybe it was a mystery to you, Ravi, but I know that when you don't communicate well with people and you don't spend time with them, a lot of times people will leave. And I think that's, that's the story that you told. Very good. Makes sense now. Uh, <clears throat> it reminds me of a quote, uh, you know, my friend Patricia Kong at scrum.org often says, the opposite of love is not hate, it's apathy. Right. So in any, in any relationship, when the other, when the partner starts become, becoming apathetic, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, uh, it's probably a warning sign. So, uh, Jay, if I could summarize some of the key lessons that I got from this story that you shared. Uh, the mistake that I made was I took a metric and Danielle was asking, well, what specific metric did I use? Uh, I used the number of customer escalations or customer issues. So, uh, so uh, you know, so the mistake I made was I used the uh, the metric to just uh, form my conclusion. And I made a huge leap. I look at the number of customer issues was going down. And so the leap was awesome. If the issues is going down, that means the customer is happy. So I did not use the metric to form a hypothesis to say, well, I don't know what's happening, but one possible hypothesis is that the customer is happy. And if I had treated it as a hypothesis, then I would have tested the hypothesis as opposed to believing or, or treating the hypothesis as the truth. So I would have tested it. I would have had the conversations with people uh, as opposed to just ending the conversation and thinking, oh yeah, I, I figured them out. I know what's going on. It's, I, I'm too busy. I don't have time to talk to those pesky customers. Uh, uh, I think they're fine. And most importantly, uh, first line of the Agile Manifesto, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So I fell so much in love with my process and my tools and my metrics that I forgot to, uh, to speak to the human being uh, who I exist to serve. So painful lesson, but powerful lesson, and hopefully 
won't make that mistake again. Uh, now, Jay, back to you. Uh, this is your story. So I'll, I'll complete the animation. If you could tell us this story, please. <clears throat> sure, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, in user experience and a lot of times working with designers, uh, the development team is always wanting their screens so they can begin development. And you don't want to not have screens because then Dev says, hey, we'd love to begin coding, but we're still waiting on the, on the designs. So sometimes in some organizations, you'll hear this a lot. You'll, you'll hear from Dev, just give me the screen so I can get my job done and make my boss happy and we can move this product uh, further on. And so uh, we, uh, we went in and we said, okay, you know, here's uh, the screens. And they said, oh, well, you know, we don't have time to do those screens. And you're like, what? And you're like, yeah, so sorry, we're just gonna have to figure something else out and all that, all that stuff that you did, um, you know, we're just gonna move forward on. So, so yeah. I'll throw it back to you, Ravi. You know, this happens again and again and again where dev is under the gun to get stuff done or release a particular deadline and achieve a goal and a metric and and ux really wants to help the user and work with the dev team how do, how do i solve this yeah so jay this is simple uh if we use a professional scrum the right time for the ux specialist and the coding and the testing the technical specialists to be reviewing these screens and talking about feasibility is it going to work or not is really backlog refinement and ideally uh, backlog refinement you want to stay two or three sprints ahead of the sprint inside of which you want to do the work so if the first time the developers get to see the screens is inside sprint planning or it's inside the sprint uh, there may not be enough time to work out the kinks, work out the disconnects, and to iterate on the screens because the clock is ticking and maybe we have already made a forecast to our stakeholders. But if we do this two or three sprints ahead of time, uh, I, think it, I think it should all work out fairly well. So, so Jade, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Uh, the key takeaway here is review the screens in backlog refinement, make sure that the UX specialists and the technical specialists are talking to each other. Um, so let's see if that works. Uh, and I think you might have another story where maybe you tried that, maybe not. So yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you and, and you brought this up because, uh, you know, uh, what's that thing, you know, uh, fool me once, right, you know, whatever. You know, the this, this saying goes, so, okay, we said, okay, we, we obviously didn't give Dev enough time to really look at the screens and everything else. Well, then we said, okay, we're going we're gonna to do double time, and we are going to design the screens way before Dev needs them and actually work with them and run these screens by them. Now, we know that Dev was currently finishing up other sprints and finishing up other work. So what we did is we went ahead and showed them all of our screens, told them the value proposition and features that we were going to uh, want to deliver in this new iteration. And uh, then three weeks later, when it actually came time for Dev to start working on it, Dev came back and said, oh yeah, uh, that's not gonna work because of our current tech stack. We, have, we haven't had the opportunity to, to fix these things. And so all these designs that you just did here for that data to show up in that field, that's not possible at this time. So I'll throw it back on you again then, Ravi, and say, okay, you know, before it was like, come to us and, and do the backlog review. And we did that. And now we're still kind of in this weird situation where now we have to redesign the screens and development still going, just, just give me the screens. Yeah. Yeah, so Jay, this, this happens all the time. Now, I, I'm glad you are giving me such a softball question. I got it all figured out. So this happens, you know, if you have a legacy architecture, most companies, they deprioritize uh, paying off the tech debt. So maybe 
code was written using COBOL or Fortran or God knows what. And uh, and so anytime the UX folks come to us and they say, hey, this is what the customer wants, the tech team says, yeah, I love that idea, but we've got a legacy architecture and we're going to have to tear everything down. We're going to have to do a completely new architecture, start from scratch. Uh, it's going to take a few million dollars come back and talk to me after five or 10 years and after five or $10 million. But you know what? We don't have that kind of money. So uh, we just got to do what we got to do. We've got to just keep bandaging uh, or bandaging the current solution. Uh, the solution is kind of held together with bandaid and some kind of chicken wire fence. But uh, I love your idea. I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen. So, um, we're going to do it the way we can do it, not the way the customer wants or the way the UX folks think. So what do you do? How do you break out of this? Uh, very simple answer. First is if you are in a ditch, uh, what do you, what's the first step? Stop digging, right? How do you get out of a deep ditch? Stop digging, right? So we've taken on a lot of technical debt. Let's cut up the credit card. Let's stop taking on new technical debt. So let's modify the definition of done. Let's make sure that at least for the new features that we are writing, let's see if we can enhance the technical standards, architectural standards, design standards, and it, can we side by side try and build the new features using new technology? And in addition to that, can we start repaying a small installment of the debt that we have taken on and accumulated over the years, right? So if it's like paying off a 0% credit card, uh, you know, the cash advance that you got, it was awesome when the promotional period was still, uh, was still running, but the moment the promotional period expired, then you're hit with humongous credit card uh, interest rates, right? So not only do you have to stop taking those, those tempting advances, cash advances, but also you gotta start paying back all the advances that you took uh, for which you now have to pay the interest, right? If we do this, then we'll have a nimble and flexible architecture. We'll start paying off our tech debt. And now when the UX folks from Jay's tribe come and tell us, hey, look at these awesome screens, ho hopefully we are not going to uh, have to show them the hand and say, no, I'm sorry, not gonna happen because we've been paying off our, our tech debt, All right? So what is the key insight? The key insight is uh, monetize and manage your technical debt I intentionally chose monetize because I have been guilty of throwing technical debt at the product owner. But remember, the product owner is ideally an entrepreneurial mini CEO. So if we throw technical jargon at, the, at, at a business person, the probability that we will be able to influence the heart and the mind and the actions of that business person, that probability is, is low. There is a risk that if we don't speak in their language, they might say, screw your technical debt. I want these features because a million dollar sales deal hinges on it. So forget your technical debt and the technical debt will never be prioritized. But if we are able to run some kind of a JVM and convert technical jargon in business terms and explain how this technical debt might have a negative impact on revenue, on EBITDA, on profit, uh, on cash flow, it's more likely that a light bulb will go on in the mind of the product owner. Now they will understand what's in it for me. Why should I prioritize paying off tech debt? Why should I prioritize not taking on new tech debt? Uh, and what's in it for me to prioritize technical excellence? So I think the onus is on us on the uh, tech side to convert from geek speak into business speak. So that's, uh, that's an important lesson that we need to learn. Um, I, the next uh, story is, again, back, I think this is uh, one of, actually this one is mine. So let me, let me share this story. Uh, and then I'm going to see if Jay has got any ideas on how to overcome this challenge. So again, uh, let's imagine we paid off the tech debt. Tech debt is no longer a barrier to collaboration between the technical, coding and testing and IT folks and Jay's tribe, which is the UX specialist. Ideally, it shouldn't even be us and them. It should be, we should all be one tribe. We should all be part of the scrum team. So we get screens from the UX, uh, UX team. 
they've been listening to the customer, they've been asking the customer, hey, what makes you sad? What's causing you pain? And the customer said, look, this is what hurts so bad. I'm, I have to reach out to Excel. I have to use Excel. I have to look at your customer's product. And then I have to stitch through a, a stitch a solution together. And it's so painful. I need three monitors to do my job. So, uh, so JC, the UX folks, they come to us, they show us all these screens. Now, the tech debt backdoor has been shut. Uh, we can no longer use tech debt as an excuse or a justification to not deliver on those screens uh, because management has been persuaded, the product owner is persuaded, they, have, they are investing, they're putting money where their mouth is. But the downside is we still go back and tell the UX folks, yeah, come back to us in a couple of years. And they say, why? Uh, and the answer is we are getting slaughtered by a parity war. So the sales force is going head to head against our competition and they're getting creamed every time. And we ask them, why are you getting creamed? And what they say is, look, here's the procurement process of the buyer. The buyer has an Excel list where they have 15 rows for the 15 most important features they want. And they have one column for all of our competitors and there's one column for us. Now the problem is the competitors have got check, check marks for all the 15 rows. And we've got check marks in only five of the 15 rows. So I know that you would like us to give these awesome features that will delight the customer, but right now I'm playing defense. Until I get check marks on those other 10 rows where we are a blank and the competition is a yes, we are gonna keep getting creamed and there won't be any money, there won't be any money to make payroll. So I love your idea, but sorry, not gonna happen. And you may think that I'm slow. We are slow like molasses, but that's just the way it is, man. So Jay, do you have any suggestions from the world of UX on how to, how to break out of this unhealthy dysfunction? Yeah, the, um, in the design thinking side of things, and, and um, we have something called the Kano model. And what the Kano model talks about is basic needs there are three kind of needs that you can work on. You can work on basic needs. You can work on performance enhancers, which is the blue arrow kind of going straight up, or you can work on delighters. The thing is, these things are not static, right? They change. And uh, delighters sometimes become uh, basic needs. For instance, if you think about the first time you had an iPhone, right? Uh, you opened up the app and, and it went full screen and you were able to, to have all these apps on, on your thing and you had a camera and you had a video. You could take you know videos, I think, maybe even later on. But the idea was those things were really cool, but now you wouldn't even think about buying a smartphone that didn't have those capabilities. And so what is the uh, delighters becomes basic needs. So this gets into what you were talking on parity. If I'm here and my customers are here and my feature list is trying to get those 10 additional check boxes thought by the time I get up to them, my competitors haven't been standing still. They haven't been saying there, oh yes, let's wait for our competition to catch up to us. They're constantly moving above us. So you're, you're playing this game of catch up, which means parity is a losing proposition. The, the objective should be if you're here, the competition's here, how can you think outside of the box? How can you really truly take a user centric approach, a customer first approach and listen to your customers, feel their pain, understand the features and value that you need to generate in your product so you're creating delighters that the competition hasn't thought of yet that then you can get ahead of them on specific features that become that value proposition that puts you ahead of the competition. And, and that's just not something I've seen from a lot of companies, but there's something called the design value index that if you look at that, it shows that companies that take that user-centric design thinking approach actually outperform companies that haven't had that kind of mindset. Very cool, very cool. Thank you, Jay. So in terms of Kano model, uh, you could use the Kano model 
as a technique or a complementary practice to coach the product owner. So the product owner is not kind of playing defense, but is playing offense. Um, one one company that uh, one company that I uh, think of in this context is Apple. I don't get the feeling. Uh, I, I'm not sure to what extent Apple is looking at Samsung and looking at all the checks that Samsung, uh, you know, Samsung's latest phone has, and then trying to replicate that. Maybe once in a while, there is some feature that they're trying to, uh, you know, get uh, catch up with Samsung. But most of the time, Apple has built such a powerful brand that when we are trying to make a purchasing decision, those customers who are completely sold on the Apple brand of the Apple value proposition uh, they are unlikely to do a side-by-side -side comparison of an Apple phone and a Samsung phone because they're just so delighted with something uh, that Apple has that they don't care about how many check marks Samsung has that Apple doesn't. Um, there's just so, something yeah. that Apple has that, that closed the deal. Yeah, you, okay, you actually ahead. reminded me of another story. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and this falls back to how we started this conversation by making assumptions. Right, it, you know, the calls went down, so you assumed people were happy. BlackBerry was actually competing with Apple when the iPhone first came out. And for the first few years, BlackBerry sales actually outperformed the sales of the Apple iPhone. But they were so focused on the assumptions that people wanted physical keyboards. Uh, on the BlackBerry, the actual tactile physical keyboard that you could, that it limited their real estate for their actually screen that, uh, uh, that they could deliver on a BlackBerry. And they couldn't get past their own uh, uh, assumptions and ideas about customers that they actually put themselves out of the marketplace because they were actually had a market share that they could have developed another smartphone with a bigger screen and taken those customers that they already had to a next level, but they were so focused that they were right that they eventually, uh, now, I don't know the last time I've seen anybody use a, a, a BlackBerry. Yeah, and, and I'm getting some questions about uh, UX and Scrum Team. Where do UX specialists fit in? And Jay and I have not had a chance to discuss this, so we may, may or may not agree. But my perspective is that the Scrum Guide has three roles. There are, uh, you know, there's the product owner, there's the Scrum Master, and there's the dev team. And maybe we can second guess Ken and Jeff about uh, choosing, a, we wish, maybe many of us wish that they had chosen a better name for the dev team role, but it is what it is. And my perspective as an Agile coach, as a Scrum coach, is the Scrum Guide clearly says that the dev team has all the skills that are needed to deliver a done increment. And in my mind, you can have a coding specialist, you could have a testing specialist, you could have a DevOps specialist, and you could have a UX specialist, and you could have all kinds of specialists, database specialists. Uh, in my mind, UX should not be a separate team working in a separate silo. UX should be part of the dev team. Uh, that's my perspective. I'm sure uh, it, this is probably a delicate and a controversially, uh, controversial topic, but I'm trying to answer that. Uh, uh, Jay, do you have any thoughts about where uh, UX, wh what have you found to work better? UX uh, specialists working inside of the Scrum team or outside or both, or is it any depends? I can't believe you brought this up, Ravi. And you know, that's it. I'm out. I'm, no, I'm 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 kidding. That was the last no, I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, um, actually, I I think with most UX teams, if you were uh, reaching out to them, if they're not, if they don't have a lot of involvement with the development team, I think you would see that they're very open to getting it as involved as they can. I know that um, at Saber. Uh, the products that re we really made good strides on where when we had tight integration uh, between the UX designers and development and product when all, and, and QA and all those folks worked together, those were we actually saw acceleration. We actually saw those products being able to develop 
the uh, the features and the value propositions to our customers. And, and we saw this happen again and again and again, because what happened was when we all got together and considered all the variabilities of feasibility, desirability, and viability, what happens is you get uh, a, a united team that are all on the same page. And customers, what we heard was customers were saying, finally, you're listening to us. Finally, you're giving us what we need. Uh, to, to make more money, take care of our customers. Thank you for finally listening to us. And we even had workshops where we had customers attend. We had uh, customers actually in there working with dev and development and product. And they had testimonials saying it was so great. And this is the customer saying this to see my ideas come through in the product that you were developing. So when you get that kind of teamwork, that kind of, you know, your customer isn't going to send you a Dear John letter because they're involved, they're invested, and they know you care. And so that's, that's the thing. It, it really is taking away those silos and working together to make sure that what you're delivering is truly what the customer wants. Awesome. Yeah, just to clarify, uh, I think what we are saying is uh, we do not recommend or at least it, what I was trying to say is we, I do not recommend that UX be the UX specialist be an outside team member who is invited like a subject matter expert to join certain scrum events, but they are running, they are doing their work in a completely separate team using separate, uh, separate structure. What I'm recommending, I'm responding to a question from an, uh, one of the attendees and maybe we'll, if, if, uh, if this doesn't answer it, we'll, deal with it offline. But what I, I just want to try to be as clear as I can, which is the, the UX team member, the UX specialist would be part of the Scrum team, they attend sprint planning, backlog refinement, sprint review, and sprint retrospective. They are no different from anyone else who is a full-time member of the team, like a coding, someone who's doing coding, testing, database, and so on. All right. So uh, key takeaway, the key insight, uh, stop playing defense with parity. Stop trying to uh, stop uh, trying to go uh, check mark for check mark against the competition. Try to play offense. Try to use uh, complementary practices like uh, maybe the Kano model. All right. Uh, we're running out of time, so I think there are two other uh, complementary practices or techniques that Jay I would like for you to share. So uh, we'll go. We'll shortcut the story. And we'll just talk about two techniques. So Jay, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about this technique. Right, and, and I briefly mentioned this earlier, is that uh, desirability is talking to the customers and figuring out as much as possible, do they want what we are trying to develop? Then you always have to take into consideration the business component, should we do it? Does this make sense for our short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals as a business? Is it viable to us as a business? And then you say, depending on what the customer is wanting, depending on your business strategy and goals, can we do it? Do we have the tech stack? Do we have the resources? Do we have the time, the money? All those things that Ravi talked about earlier um, does it make sense to actually try to do these things? So this is, I, I learned this when I went through the, the IDEO uh, uh, design thinking facilitation, is this is just a core thing to think about as you're thinking, how do we develop this product for the future? Very cool. Thanks, Jay. So let's see if we can integrate design thinking into product backlog management, product ownership, product management. And now for the last, uh, but the most important idea that I have uh, learned from Jay that Jay is evangelizing and advocating for. Yeah, this book is, is by an author, Indy Young. And boy, do I recommend this book. Um, in it, uh, she talks a lot, of, especially if you're a data-driven company, which a lot of companies nowadays are, we, we can get so lost in the data in terms of what and how is happening that we kind of lose our soul 
a little bit, Ravi. We, we, we fail to remember why we're doing what we're doing. And, and if we don't understand the why, we get, we get sidelined or we get uh, kind of uh, taken off guard like you did at the beginning of your story. You thought you were taking care of business. You thought you were taking care of making sure everything was being done right, only to get, you know, not even a Dear John letter when your customers started leaving. You had to figure it out after the fact on the thing. So um, practical empathy is a fantastic resource for you especially if you're a developer, to get in there and understand both components of, of qualitative data and quantitative data, which, which we love, and how do you get the best of both worlds as you're trying to figure out what to develop and, and, and how to make your product successful. Yeah, and, and Jay, as a developer, I have been guilty of uh, lacking empathy for my users, <laughs> my customers, because I am just so stressed out by my manager breathing down my neck and just asking me, when is that feature going to be done? And my manager is probably stressed out by the director or the VP because they don't want to show up in the shit list of the CIO, right? I mean, there's going to be a red, yellow, green status report. The CIO is probably going to be in a meeting with the CEO and CIO doesn't want to look like an idiot. So it all rolls downhill and I am... And now my primary uh, focus becomes how to not get in trouble with my manager and anything and anybody that gets in the way, especially pesky customers are, are an irritant, are a distraction. So, uh, you know, working with Jay has reminded me um, to first take a deep breath to pause and to shift focus from the milestones and the deliveries and the deadlines and to shift focus and start thinking about how is the decision I'm about to make, how is it going to impact the life of a user who is relying on my product to achieve their outcomes? So empathy is something that is we could do better, uh, better with on the IT side, and, uh, and I'm really grateful to Jay for reminding us about that. So takeaway, uh, increase empathy for all stakeholders. Uh, uh, empathy among developers for each other, empathy between the dev specialists, uh, you know, the technical specialists and UX and vice versa, and most importantly, empathy for our customers. So, I, 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 uh, do, I do have a I response guess. really quick to somebody that uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, Nawaz. I, I hope I'm not sorry. Nawaz, Nawaz yeah, yeah. Yeah, your name. Nawaz. Um, one of the things I teach uh, when I teach at SMU for my intro to UX class is you are not your user. Now, it sounds counter, counterintuitive based on what uh, Ravi and I have been saying is you need to be empathetic for your user, but you have to understand you are not your user. Um, the, the kind of warning story on that um, is... Um, uh, uh, crash test dummies have been used by car manufacturers to test and, and be the, the kind of gold standard for are the airbags and safety conditions in cars reliable. Well, what happened was uh, in 1997, when this became the de facto standard, all the crash test dummies were developed with the uh, height and weight of the average male. They, they resembled all the engineers who were developing the car. And the, the byproduct of that, by, by not considering the extremes, the other folks that you had, 17%, uh, and this was from the uh, National uh, Transportation Study, showed that 17% of women who were drivers or passengers actually had more fatalities and it actually wound up being that 73% of women were more likely to be injured in car wrecks. So you have to be mindful about you are not your user and really talk to your users to understand their pains, their things, because so often we assume if it works for me, it should work for everyone else. 
And we need to really be mindful of the fact that if we don't consider things, sometimes in the case of cars, it can actually be the difference between life and death. So that's, that's why you want to work with your UX professionals, because we're constantly going to be challenging each other and being mindful of not making assumptions about our products that, that wind up actually being detrimental or not of value to our other customers who are not like us. Yeah. And yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think this is also a reason why diversity on the team matters. So if we can try to have members on the scrum team uh, either who think like or, uh, you know, or who are connected, the more we have members on the scrum team who know what it feels like to walk in the shoes of uh, the user, uh, hopefully there will be less of a chance where we don't even know of the existence of a particular type of user because there is an advocate, one or two advocates on the team who are always uh, bringing up their concern. So some time ago, I did a webinar, a scrum.org, scrum pulse webinar on diversity. Uh, and one of our fellow trainers, uh, David Bain, he's actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, he has, uh, you know, he has a disease which makes it, uh, which, which makes it hard for him to walk. Actually, he can't walk. He's in a, uh, in a wheelchair. And in fact, he even, he has challenges uh, even getting access to his wallet. And he's a very social person. So what he used to say is there are so many times he was dying to have a conversation with a friend in a Starbucks, but the task of going to a Starbucks filled his mind with dread because here's what he would have to do. When he went to the checkout counter of Starbucks, he would have to ask a complete stranger, the person behind his wheelchair, to reach out into his backpack, to take out his wallet, to take out his credit card, to swipe the credit card, and then put the credit card back in the wallet and wallet back in the backpack and then backpack in his wheelchair. Uh, because he, uh, he did not have the ability to reach out to uh, uh, reach into his wallet. So things that everybody else considers uh, a given, we don't even think about it. That was a struggle for Dave Dame. And the game changer for him was Apple Pay, I think, or where you know you can just take out your cell phone and maybe you tap it. And he had with that the with the release of that feature, he had greater autonomy and ability to go and get a cup of coffee because he no longer had to ask a complete stranger to reach into his backpack and his wallet and to make a payment. So uh, we are not our users and we will never be our users. Uh, and if we can create diversity on our team, there is a greater probability that at least someone on our team will watch out for our users. And then we also have our UX colleagues. So we are coming to the end of our time box. I want to be respectful. We have a few more minutes, maybe uh, for some questions. So I'm scanning the panel, uh, the, the Q&A panel, and I'm looking at, uh, Harry has a question here, um, a bunch of questions here. I'd like to see if you can cover some real pains of the integration of disciplines. UX is in as much pressure to deliver as the team. UX is integrate, integrated but cannot be helped by anyone. They are specialists. PO is working with the UX client and dev, wireframes, finished models, UX standards, front-end standards, testing, and how we test with UX and code, and all teams are matrixed. So, uh, that's a long, uh, complex question, Harry. I don't know if we can answer all of it. I'll just share briefly my thoughts and then Jay can chime in. Uh, my feeling is that uh, I've seen this anti-pattern in a lot of ways. You may have a database modeling, a DBA specialist or a DevOps specialist or a UX specialist, uh, but in a nutshell, the anti-pattern is there is one person who has deep knowledge in one area and there are more developers who require to use that knowledge than have that knowledge. So this one person becomes a bottleneck. Uh, in my mind, what has worked for me is this is an anti-pattern. Uh, we need to create a learning plan where we disseminate this knowledge from that one specialist over time. And that specialist should almost become like a coach who is being very intentional about when 
do they do the work themselves? Uh, and we teach this technique in the scrum.org scale professional scrum class in the context of an access integration team. So we teach specialists to be very thoughtful when someone comes and asks them for help and we ask them to consider three choices. Do I do it myself? Do I delegate because I think they can do it? Or do I teach them how to fish so they may not be able to fish to feed themselves now, but once I teach them in the future, they can learn how to fish. So uh, that's my thought. Uh, Jay, what are your thoughts? How do we scale the UX specialization in, in these complex real world situations? So um, uh, I haven't been a developer for a while, but I was a developer for about 10 years uh, doing a lot of web development uh, in the 90s, 90s to the early 2000s. <laughs> And, uh, and then now I've been um, doing uh, user experience. Well, I've been doing user experience before they called it user experience. But um, I, I will tell you that the pressure is, is that's one of those assumptions. Uh, I, I, I think I heard correctly that uh, UX doesn't have the same pressure as dev. I, th I, I think that, that it, I guess it depends on the company, but I can tell you that our team feels a lot of pressure all the time because um, we know that if we don't get the, the screens designed correctly and they don't get implemented correctly, the experience that we're trying to create for the customer is not going to be the experience that we hope and think they want. So uh, there's a lot of pressure that goes beyond and we trust Dev to actually not take our designs as just recommendations that a lot of time and detail goes into those designs. And, and there's a lot more than just pretty pictures behind it. And I think as a former developer, I understand that perspective that it's, you know, designers just make pretty pictures. And, and that's not true. There's a big difference between UX and UI, just the aesthetic component of designs and the functional component of designs. And user experience, it's about an experience, it's about a flow. It's not just the aesthetic nature of the designs that we take into consideration. So that's a learning opportunity that I think teams can understand that it's just not about pretty pictures and changing little things here and there actually does make a difference. It's kind of like me telling you, do you really need that semicolon at the end of that line? Can't we just get rid of that? No, your code's not gonna work right that's that's built into the syntax of the code so those little things come in and the more time people spend with each other the more time stakeholders and groups understand other people's perspectives then that helps for a better product for our customers because again i, I completely agree with ravi that the more time you spend having conversations and kind of learning each other's disciplines just enough to make better suggestions that team becomes more, more cohesive and it actually is an accelerator to being more productive because you have less rework. And, and there's lots of industry standards that show that fixing something after something has been released at minimum can cost 10 times uh, to fix. So, so when the team works together better, uh, it reduces costs, makes customers happy, uh, happier, um, and you can then get working on additional products to catch up with the competition. So my two cents on that, Ravi. Very good. Thank you, Jay. Uh, one last thing, question was, how is Agile incorporating empathy? Uh, in my mind, if you look at the Agile mani manifesto, it starts with empathy. It says individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So it starts with empathy. And I feel that sometimes that aspect is lost. People blindly and ritualistically follow some practices uh, without understanding the spirit. They blindly follow the rituals. But if you look at the Agile Manifesto, and if you look at the Agile Principles, and just see how many times it mentions customer. In my mind, these are the foundations. Empathy is the foundation of Agile, the Agile Manifesto, and the Agile Principles. But it's just that uh, the spirit is lost and people ritualistically follow the letter. One practice that is very common in the Agile industry is a user story. And it starts with as a blah, as a user. And some people 
write user stories where they actually use the word user, which defeats the whole purpose. But the intent was replace user with either a, a persona or, and you don't even have to use that template. Ward Cunningham, the guy who created user story never meant for there to be a template. But that is uh, a practice, uh, the practice of user stories, which is intended to bring empathy and to help the developers walk in the shoes of the human being whose life they are trying to improve through the delivery of this story. All right. So folks, that's all the time we have uh, for today. I hope that you found this useful. Uh, and if you have any questions, especially in the area of, of UX, I hope that you will reach out to Jay on LinkedIn, uh, connect with him, attend one of his <laughs> courses. Uh, and uh, and I hope you found this useful. Jay, any closing thoughts from you before we wrap up? So what, I, what I'm uh, trying to do real quick is uh, pull up my LinkedIn so that I can, uh, I can uh, share my uh, LinkedIn uh, profile with you guys in case you do wanna, you wanna reach out to me. Uh, uh, LinkedIn is actually probably the best way to reach out to me with questions. Uh, I can't always guarantee that I'll get back to you uh, soon, but uh, I will do my best. Um, I would say, Ravi, this is uh, not what we've talked about today is not something that's limited to any particular co uh, company. From my experience, all companies deal with this and there's no one size fits all because every company's culture is slightly different. And um, uh, there are situations where if you embed a UX professional on a team that is kind of outvoted by more agile slash development folks. It, 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 it tends to be a UX team of one against everybody else. And I've been in that situation. I've made recommendations where I knew the team was going down the wrong path and they just out, outvoted me. And the truth is the product that I eventually left that company and I found out later that they missed the deadline by six months because what they delivered was not what the customer wanted. But sometimes we just get wrapped up into those metrics and, and pressure and we just got to deliver something. But then, you know, your competition can get a year ahead of you and then you're really behind the curve and you risk the business going out of business because your competition maybe listened to their customers better and made better decisions up front. So uh, th that's kind of my final thought that we're not trying to prescribe, it's more of a framework and, and using the agile process to say, use what makes sense in your company and in your culture, but having everybody be in alignment and making sure that you are not your user make sure that you're just not developing a product that's only gonna work for one particular segment of your potential customers. And so that's, I think, the key, one of those other key takeaways that I hope people remember. I, I saw in the chat, Amir said, and I wanna read this, he, he said, great story, Jay, we were looking in an apartment recently, and my wife said a similar comment about a kitchen saying, this kitchen was designed by a man who never cooks. Let's make sure as developers, that we're not <laughs> designing, doing the same thing with our customers. So thank you very much, Amir, for, for that comment because it, it, it quite beautifully represented that sometimes we can make something that's functional but really not have the understanding of the people that are really gonna use it. So that's, that's uh, my closing comment there. Very good, thank you so much, Jay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Janie, for getting us together. Stay safe, stay healthy, uh, keep calm, and come on. Bye. Thank you. Bye.